This is Join Us in France, episode 267. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and in today's episode, I am delighted to have a conversation about Corsica with Michael Groves, because he knows France really well and spends about half the year in France. I've tried to get him on the podcast before, but he's one of those guys who says, oh, I wouldn't know what to say. And then he opens his mouth and watch out. <laughs> he's a great resource of knowledge and inspiration about travel to France. Michael keeps a really nice travel blog, which includes a great article about this trip to Corsica. You'll find it at mlgroves.com and there will be a link to it in the show notes. If you've never heard of Corsica, it's an island about 300 kilometers south of Nice. You can fly into Corsica or take a ferry, which takes about five hours. Generally speaking, this is not a vacation spot that's high on the radar for English-speaking visitors, but it is such a wonderful place. Anyone wanting to go off the beaten track in France should consider it. Michael explored the northern part of Corsica, what we call Haute Corse in French, and his drive included Bastia, Roliano, uh, Centuri, Saint-Florent, Lille Rousse, Calvi, Porto e Carges. Oh, as well as Corte. You can see a map of his trip in the show notes. Now, this is not the sort of vacation where you rush from one monument to another. This is a drive, hike, swim, and take pictures kind of vacation. Eat and drink, too, of course. This is France. I've only been to Corsica once, but it's pretty clear to me that it's a little bit of paradise on Earth. Corsicans have a strong regional culture. They speak both French and Corsican with pride. Their food and wine are remarkable, and the scenery is hard to beat. It's mountainous. It's beautiful. Plus, for history buffs, a lot of history happened there, including Napoleon, you know, Napoleon. Listen up, you might want to get inspired to add it to your list. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 267. That's the number, 267. And if you're planning a trip to France, the site is chock full of great resources. You should check it out, especially episode 173, which is also about Corsica. <laughs> Michael Groves, welcome to join us in France. It's lovely to have you to talk about Corsica. Merci. Bonjour, Annie. Bonjour, bonjour. All right, so today we're talking about Haute Corse. So this is the upper part of Corsica. If you kind of draw a line across the island, diagonally a little bit, we're going to be talking about the part that's the north... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to Should qualify. I, uh, give yeah, you a description of where that G is. Give it a go. Yes. Okay. If you take a look at uh, Corsica, uh, and, and it might be a good idea for your listeners to have a, a map out. I'll put so a map on the show notes. Okay. Super. Uh, if you look at Corsica, it looks like a, a clenched fist with a finger pointing north. Yeah. And if you look at the base of that finger at the town uh, Bastia. And then draw a line across Corsica to the west coast down to a small town called Carges. Uh, it is above that line where I spent, uh, I spent the month. Wow, a whole uh, month. And, That's lovely. Yeah, it was 29 days. And I uh, spent most of that time on the coast, uh, mm -hmm. um, except for some trips to a trip to Cor uh, Corte. Uh -huh. in the center in the mountains, and then I spent some time in the uh, Bologna area on the west coast. The Bologna is uh, like a, what, a county or a state, and I went up to some perched villages um, up there. But by and large, it was mostly on the, uh, yeah. It was yeah. on the coast. So this was not your first trip to France. You've been to France several times, right? I, I typically spend uh, six months out of the year 
in France. I'm in Antibes for three months. I've been doing that for close to 10 years. Uh, I have a bus pass. I have two discounted train passes, a gym <laughs> membership. Yeah. And, a lot of, and a lot of people like, are going to be jealous. I assume you're retired <laughs> or do you also work at the same time? No, no, no. I'm retired. I haven't uh, worked for quite a while. So, uh, But anyway, I, I'm there in Antibes. I winter on the Riviera. I like to say that every once in a while. Yes, um, that sounds very posh. <laughs> Very posh. It's a little obnoxious, but uh, I do it anyway sometimes. <laughs> so I, I returned to Portland, Oregon for 90 days. And then in August, September, and in October, I return and I divide that time among Paris, Marseille, and Lyon. And sometimes I choose September and I go someplace else. I was in Malta for a month and I walked cool. the Chemin de Saint Jacques. Uh, one September, and this year I decided to spend that month in uh, Corsica. Very nice. Specifically Haute Corse. Yes, Haute Corse. Yeah, is, it was really cool. Yeah, it's very scenic, isn't it? There is a huge difference between going to Paris and to Corsica. When you go to Paris, uh, your primary tourist attractions are those magnificent grand man-made constructions mm -hmm. uh, but you won't really find that in Corsica or up the upper Corsica you'll see citadels but those are more like uh, fortress villages those are huge and grand right most of the time you are looking at nature yes and this is a wild part of Corsica it's it's vast and untamed. It's a pays sauvage, if you will. Mm -hmm. And much of my time was looking at um, looking at um, the views, the panoramic views, or from up on high and looking down, or I was at sea level, uh, looking up at the clunk and. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's gorgeous. Um, it's 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 a place where I I think a lot more people should. Uh, consider, you know, consider visiting, including myself, because I've really just been to the south of Corsica and even then briefly. So, uh, you know, but the, we, we've done another episode about it and it sounded really, really nice. So let's yeah, go into it was, some, it was super. Let's go into some details of the itinerary you took. You started out in Bastia, which is, I assume you Correct. flew there or you took a, a boat? I took a ferry from ferry. Marseille. Yeah. To, it was an overnight ferry to to Bastia. And then I was in Bastia for th uh, three days, three nights. And then I took the train up to Corte. And I spent three nights there, returned to Bastia, picked up a car uh, rental, and drove uh, north into Cup Course to the tip of that finger uh, to Massinaggio and then over to uh, Rogliano, a uh, perched village where I stayed two nights. Then over to the west coast, Santuri. And from Santuri, I then drove south to San Florent, where I stayed for four nights. And then to uh, Il Rus. Mm -hmm. And then to Calvi, Porto, and Carges. And Carges was the end. And uh, Underneath that line that we drew from Bastia down to Carges, there is actually a, uh, a road that goes through central Corsica between Carges and Bastia. And yeah. I drove that uh, back to Bastia and then caught the ferry back to Marseille, where I am now. So I'm, I'm imagining that this is very mountainous. The center, are you talking about? Yes. On the coast? Yes. Uh, well, it's on the coast, it is mountainous and very large hills and when you go through the center it is yes very very high and the roads are twisty and curvy i heard the phrase a twat a torture to describe the uh yeah the <laughs> yes so not ideal for people who have uh, uh, issues with uh, being car sick i assume yes and also you might have some discussions about who's not going to be sitting in the passenger seat, especially if you're driving south, because it's on the passenger side where you're going to be looking down into the 
Mediterranean Sea, and it's uh, pretty harrowing on that side of the car sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so it, it might give you a, you know, if you're afraid of heights or something. Yeah, it's it's very rugged from the photos I've seen. It looks like it's really, really rugged and scenic and, and, and just... Uh, so tell me some of your favorites. Like, so Bastia is a big city, right? Yes, well... Yes, it's the uh, second largest city in Corsica, and it's the largest port. And I was there for the, for three days. Probably the highlight for for me is the old port, and then also because I like the panoramic views, going up to the citadel. And the citadel is like a, a small village. There are people living up there, and you can stand in various locations to look down at the port and to look out onto the Mediterranean to the north, and then you have to go to the other side to look uh, to, the, to the south. Right. But there's an old village there, and you uh, can – I spent three, three, three days, but you could easily spend um, a day and then, and then move on. Right. Because everything, every town, every city in the or, uh, upper Corsica is pretty small, mm-hmm. pretty small. Mm-hmm. So I am assuming you'll be able to. You stayed at hotels most of the time. Uh, yes, although I did have a uh, see, it was not quite an Airbnb. I booked everything. I think it's through booking book booking dot com. Yeah, I had a, a studio in uh, Calvi, ah. but yes, it was it was in in hotels. Yes, now, I might I might add if I can, since we're on the subject of hotels, I. I was there in this last September, and I discovered very quickly that I was in the high season, or yes. the, sometimes called the medium high season. And I was hoping to kind of wing it uh, and kind of adjust my the amount of time I would spend in various places. And I had already booked Bastia and Corte, and I started looking for some places on the cup course. And I discovered that it was really hard to find some place to stay and I um, uh, they were booked or yeah. they were too uh, too expensive uh, yeah. for my for my budget yeah so I eventually booked the entire month before I left Bastia to go north mm-hmm. but it was in hotels yeah 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 I think Corsica is going to be very popular uh, up, up until probably this time of year we're recording mid October late October, I think uh, the season starts dwindling down probably in October. Uh, Correct. But the weather is so nice in Corsica, I mean, you know, that it's it probably stays summer a long, long time. Uh, September was, was fabulous. Uh, it was sunny and clear virtually – Virtually every day that I was that I was there. So better weather than Marseille, you would say? Uh, right now. Or? Well, like comparative, you know. I'm, I'm no, assuming. I think it, no, no, I think it's pretty much the. It's, it's similar. Much the same. Yeah. yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. One thing I should note that before I took off for Corsica, I uh, I really didn't know what to expect, and when I got there, I discovered that kind of continuing the theme of what you were saying about uh, lots of people discovering Corsica. It is a one big resort island. Uh, it mm. was fabulous. It was um, it, uh, They had great accommodations all along the coast and, um, and restaurants everywhere. Lots and lots of tourists. Mm-hmm. Not very many Americans, but uh, lots of uh, lots, lots of, of visitors. Tourists. Yeah, lots of yeah. French people go to Corsica. There were a lot of Germans, uh, Spanish, Italians. Yeah. Yeah, I my biggest connection this is going to be sound very funny to you, but my biggest co- connection to Corsica is a radio show I listen to every week. It's a gardening show and they it just makes me dream all the plants they can put in Corsica. Oh. Like it's it's like a paradise, you know, and I just like to think about it. Sometimes I try one in Toulouse and uh, some often it's a fail. <laughs> Oh, my sense was that the Corsicans really, really like their country, or their – what do you call Corsica? A country or a state or a part of France? It's a department, uh, but department, yeah. but it, it is a department with a very strong local 
regional culture. Yes, they, and identity. Yes, and they have their own language, which kind of sounds like Italian a little bit. I speak Italian fairly well, and Corsican is... Uh, I... I I understand what they're saying, but I can't respond in Corsican because I I lack a lot of uh, vocabulary. They use their local language a lot, uh, uh, a lot more than in Toulouse, for example, because in Toulouse we have Occitan, which hardly anybody speaks. It's really rare to hear it on the street, whereas Corsican, at least they will greet each other in Corsican and say goodbye in Corsican. Uh, they they might not have the whole conversation. Even on this radio show, very often they just switch to Corsican in the middle oh. of, of uh, you know just a few sentences here and there. You know, it's it's really interesting. So it's a very strong regional identity, and um, sometimes French people who go say you know they don't like us mainland people so much <laughs> but i don't think that's uh, it i think they just i mean they have their own thing you know yeah i i i, I saw that and and uh, i would go into the markets for example and you would see uh products clearly marked uh uh being produced in corsica there would be stores everywhere that uh would clearly identify that all these products were um uh, were French, or excuse me, were Corsican. From Corsican, yeah, yeah, and and it's pretty expensive, I thought, uh, as well. Is compared to the rest of France, what did you think? Uh, the, being expensive, yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, no. Okay. I don't think so. No, um, the price range for the the hotels and for the meals were were comparable mm -hmm. to main, the mainland and the. Uh, no, I, I can't. Uh, okay, okay. I'm searching for s some places where it might have been, but uh, no. Not too bad. Okay. No. So what were your favorites of all these places? And I'll put the map. I'll um, If you send me the names of the hotels where you stayed, I'll put links there so people can have an idea of, of what it was like. But w what were your favorites of all these long you know, month-long uh, visit? Because I'm assuming most listeners are not going to take a month. No, I think you can probably cover the the northern part of Corsica, at least the route that I took, within a week easily, 10 days, uh, depending on whether or not you wanted to go up into the Perch Villages or not. Um, I uh, found that I was um, high up often and looking out and down. Mm. And the first place was that was really stunning was in Corte. And I took the train up there specifically because I wanted to see what it was like uh, on the inland because I knew I was going to spend most of my time in the on the coastal areas. But in Corte, there is a citadel that is really high on a promontory. And you need to pay to to get into it. You go to the museum, you pay an entrance fee, and then you can go into the museum or you can turn left and go to this uh, citadel. And, and, and you get this really, really fabulous uh, panoramic view of not only down into Corte, but also into the valley below and into wow, the mountains yeah. in, the, in the distance. Uh, if you don't want to go into the museum, you can uh, go to a promontory that is just below uh, Corte and, and get something that's very similar. So that was the first really big surprise as far as the views. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I was there also, I heard for the first time uh, some Corsican a cappella polyphonic singing. Mm. There was a group called Spartera who performed on the night before I left. And maybe you've seen pictures, these men put a cupped hand over an ear so that they can better hear one another. Yeah, because they sing pretty and, loud. <laughs> yes, they do. And they're in, uh, they perform in churches, the main church in, the, in, the, in Corte. But later I discovered that they also, uh, there were a number of these groups, and they performed along the West Coast in uh, many of the, 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 the churches. 
uh, really, really wonderful uh, uh, experience. Yeah, the harmonies uh, are nice. It's kind of a, if you like, if you enjoy choral music, it's about the opposite end to. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's not subtle. <laughs> okay. No. It's very loud, very strong, manly man singing. That's what it is. Yes. 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 I only know of one uh, all-female group. Most of them are, are yeah. three, four, five males uh, yeah. Yeah. singing a cappella. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's well, lovely. The, yes. Okay. The, maybe the, uh, the second place I'll tell you about is Nonza, which I would really recommend. It is... Nonza. Some, How do you spell Nonza. that? N-O-N-Z-A. Okay. Onza. It's a, it may be a beau village, I'm not sure, but it is south of Santuri, somewhere between about maybe two-thirds of the way down the coast towards saint Florent. And there are the villages on the, on the left and the right, and as you're going south on the right, it rises up a bit, and there is a, a tower up there. And you'll notice right away on both the east coast and the west coast, these small towers, their observation posts to, I, I assume, for looking out for pirates during the day and also uh, looking out for any invading armies. But there's a tower up there and you can climb up uh, through the village up to that tower and then you get another spectacular view north uh, on the coastline and then down into the Gulf of uh, saint Florent. Mm. Right below that uh, tower is a restaurant, and I know your listeners want to know about the restaurant. Of so course. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you about uh, about La Sasa. When I went to Corsica, I had a handful of destination restaurants. I really wanted to uh, eat in these restaurants, and La Sasa, S A S S A, yeah, uh, was one of them. And it has no buildings. Uh, the kitchen is not enclosed in a building. Really? Yes, the entire restaurant is in the open on this rocky knoll just below the tower, and they put up these elegant tarps to cover the dining area to protect the uh, the diners. And the kitchen is under that underneath that as well. Mm. And all of the tables are situated so you have this fabulous, fabulous view um, of the Mediterranean, also the, the coast line up to the to the north so do you think this restaurant is there year round or is uh, ephemeral no it's ephemeral it closes at the end of september Ah. and reopens sometime in may Hmm. it has to go away because there's nothing there to to, uh you know there's no buildings at all so right right wow so that was a a very lovely experience uh, and another place where I had this fabulous view, but I also got a meal to go along with it. <laughs> Let me give you one more example of uh, some place where I was high up and then looking down. Uh, out of saint Florent, one can go up to a pass. Now, saint Florent and Bastia are across from one another on the east coast and the west coast. And it's about 15 miles between the two of them. You go s- about seven miles from saint Florent, Florent up to this pass, and it's called the Col de Tegime, T-E-G-H-I-M-E. Okay. And it is, I think, one of the highest passes in all of Corsica. Mm-hmm. And you can place yourself in a certain spot and face north, and look to your right and look down into Bastia and the Mediterranean and then just turn your head to the left and look down into saint Florent yeah. and, the, and the Mediterranean on the, uh, the west coast. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It was fun. Sounds good. And the trip up there, you go through Patrimonio, which is a small village, but also it's a region that is uh, a wine-growing region, and it's got an AOC designation, and there are many, many vineyards where you can stop and, uh, and uh, taste the wine. Mm-hmm. So those are the 
maybe three examples of where I was way up high and I was looking down. But let me give you a couple examples where I was at water level and looking up. And this, these two places may have been my most favorite places to visit. Uh, one was the, the uh, Kalank de Piana. Okay, Kalank de Piana. The Kalank de Piana. Okay. De Piana. And Piana is a village. And the, the, the Kalank are right below this, uh, this village. And then the other is the Reserve Naturelle de Scandola. Mm-hmm. And to visit those places, you need to take a, a boat. Mm. So, although one can go through the Kalank on a road on the way to Piana, and that road is, is harrowing. It's very, it's narrow, <laughs> turns. Um, I dropped down to something like 10 miles an hour yeah. in, in a couple places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can imagine very narrow, very, you know, impressive looking because you have the uh, falaise or what do you say that? Uh, the uh, You have the drop to one side and so you're like, ah. Yes, yes <laughs> yeah. it is a very precipitous drop. Yeah. And these very large towering granite uh, columns and, oh, I, I don't want to call it mountains because they're not that, but they're striated and uh, they're just really glorious. They, they take on a maybe a red or rose uh, uh, tinge to them. Mm. That's why some of them are called, uh, there's a place called Le Roche Rouge and it's named after the Kalank. Mm-hmm. But you could go, you could take a boat through it, or excuse me, a, a car through that. But the best way is to take a boat and there are two different kinds. There is a, a kind of a small skiff and they're called... Uh, Sumi rigid, semi rigid. Yeah. And so they only, it's like they a only, blown up, like rubber raft. Yeah. Yes. Sort of. And they uh, allow twelve people to sit in them, and you have to sit, and it's open, and they're fast, and it's the cheapest way to to visit the 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 Cologne. The other is the vedette. And that is a typical boat with a cabin, and then there's a bathroom, and they serve drinks if you ask for them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's more expensive. Mm-hmm. But out of Calvi, Porto, and Carges, you can take a boat out. And I recommend taking the boat from Porto because then the distance isn't, isn't so great. But uh, you get this uh, up-close view of these huge geological formations. Yeah. Now, we're impressed with the, the monuments in Paris, but I would argue that um, what you see in, this, in the Reserve de Scandola and the Calanque is, is equal, if not more breathtaking. Right. The, so. I assume that if you like hiking, you could hike all day long. And, and even to get to these perched up villages, there's probably a fair amount of uphill walking involved. I'm not sure how much there. Are. I saw a lot of hikers and also hitchhikers. I'm not <laughs> sure uh, how much of the Kalank and how, especially how much of the reserve reserve you can walk in. Uh, they're protected areas. Uh, okay. They're identified by UNESCO, uh, but there are lots and lots of hiking trails. Right. Uh, and I know going up to Piana, going through the Kalank. In a car and going up to Piano, there were places where uh, there were some parking spots and people were getting out, getting ready to. Uh, right, trailheads. To... Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would bet that this is a favorite activity of, of locals and visitors is to go on beautiful, long, steep hikes. <laughs> yes. Also, uh, taking hikes along the beaches. I haven't mentioned the beaches, and that's one of the drawing points of of uh, Corsica and Old Course as well. Very beautiful beaches. So do they have sandy beaches most of the time, or is it rocky? Uh, yeah. yeah, the ones that I saw, it's it's sandy. Uh, uh, yes, I'm trying to think of some place that was actually rocky, and I can't think of a place right, right now. Right. But so, yeah. So it was mostly sandy. Yes. So, so far, your favorite, your favorite places were Monza, Pina... You haven't talked about Pina, have you? No, I haven't. 
Pina is a village out of Ile Rus. It is in the Bologna area. It's one of those haute vila, haute, uh, 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 a perch village. Yeah. And um, you can actually visit two of those village in, in one day, Pina, and then you can continue on up to Santo Antonino. Okay. And Pina has this... Uh, this large corral made of uh, of uh, very thick stone, and I think during the Middle Ages it was uh, used for confining animals, but now it's been converted into a, a performing arts uh, place. It's mm. it's open to the air, and that's really fun to walk into and walk around. Then the village, uh, it's like some other villages that I've seen. It has a lot of artisan uh, glass uh, uh, stores. Mm-hmm. One of the nice things Pottery, about probably. It, pottery is there. Yeah. And I discovered, I was there early in the morning, and I discovered these two small cafes. One it was called Casarella, and the other one was called Cantina a uh, Moresca, I think. Okay. Those are all words. And I fell in love with those places because they were kind of, I don't know, they were buried a bit and there were vines and trees uh, hiding them. And they were kind of ramshackle. And there was, uh, in the Casarella, there was a, a bamboo, uh, kind of a, not a roof, but a, a, sh- a shade. And I went into that, and it opened up into this small terrace that was just lovely. Mm. And you get drinks there. And I went to the end of this uh, bench, and I had this, again, a fabulous view of the uh, the valley below and the um, and the uh, Mediterranean, and then a village down on the on the uh, on the coast. There is a restaurant there. I should mention. Um, let's see. I'm not sure if I remember what it was called. Um, I forget what it was called. Mm. But there's a restaurant there that uh, I, I really highly recommend, and I'll give you the name of it later. Yeah, if you can, if you can think of it, I'll put it in the show notes. It sounds like and, it's a great place to go if you just want to fill your head with beautiful images of scenic beautiful peaceful places because even with all the tourists did it ever feel crowded or i felt claustrophobic more in the in places like calvi and larger towns uh, san florent um there are not very many tourists in, in uh, even in this high season in september yeah in the, in, in the villages right because uh-huh. it's, as soon as you need to be climbing up the you know the village streets there are fewer people <laughs> exactly and you can actually go from pina go up a little bit higher to sant antonino and i know that is a a beau village and you can spot that from a from a distance it sits up on a on a large knoll mm-hmm. and and that is on granite mm. and you will walk around some of those ruelles those little streets and be walking over boulders over stone rather than uh, than pavement. Let's, there, let's, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, well, I, there's, <laughs> I'll mention one restaurant there. There is a, a fairly well-known restaurant there called I Scalini, I-S-C-A-L-I-N-I. And they brag about their, um, their 360 degree uh, panoramic view of the countryside. And so you can sit, uh, sit in that restaurant, have a meal and, uh, and look around. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of restaurants, tell us a little bit about the local cuisine, the specialties of the area. You've mentioned the wine already, but I, this is something that I enjoy is, uh, rosé from Corsica is usually mm. really good. Yes. I drank, uh, I drank the white wine a lot and the rosés. I'm not sure about the red wines. But one of the uh, things you'll see often is the cheese, the brochure cheese, mm-hmm. B-R-O-C-C-U-I. Mm-hmm. I think I pronounced it correctly, brochure. And that cheese is uh, served in a lot of things. It's like a, um, 
uh, I don't know if it's a mozzarella. It's really mild cheese, and it's served in a dessert, a fiodone, F-I-A-D-O-N-E. Right. It's like a cheesecake. And oh. often the pastry chefs will use some fruit or nuts or something to flavor the cheese because of the mild taste. Mm -hmm. It shows up in omelets all the time. Uh, one of the uh, main dishes, and sometimes an entree, I would see the, the, the cannelloni uh, uh, au brochure, a stuffed cannelloni. Mm -hmm. And there is a, oh, I don't know if it's a dessert, but a, um, a pastry. It's called beignet. Yeah. Beignet au chaud sucre. And what they do is they make a batter uh, with the cheese and then they form a little ball of dough and then deep fry it. Sometimes they are stuffed with, uh, with apples. Huh. So, beignet au quoi sucré? Beignet, uh, beignet au chaud. Au uh, chaud. chaud. Yeah, chaud sucré or salé. So, it's C-H-A-U-D? Yes. Huh. Beignet, yeah, beignet au chaud sucré. Or, au chaud or sucré. Or... I have never heard of this. I'm yeah. looking them up. And there's also a pancake that uh, it's called a magliaccio, magliaccio. Uh, and it is um, basically a batter with chunks of this uh, brochio cheese. And it's uh, cooked like a, an American pancake. Hmm. And then they, you pay a euro and they hand it to you and then you eat it. And hmm. it's delicious. Hmm. It's Overall, did you enjoy the gastronomy of the area? Because they, they also do a lot of charcuterie, don't they? Yes, and I was going to mention that. There's uh, uh, Copa and Lonzu are two of the major charcuterie. But the other one is not quite the same as those two I mentioned. It's called a fijatelu. Yeah. You can tell fijatelu. Yeah. It's more like a, a sausage. It's, it's cooked and it's kind of grainy when you when you cut into it and often unlike the la, uh, lanzu and the copa the uh, fijatelu would be cooked before it's uh, served to you <laughs> it might be served like a sausage uh, with an omelet <laughs> um, it uh, apparently it's it's it can't hang for very long mm. it has to be consumed rather quickly mm. So that and let me tell you, uh, do you know about Oretza, the sparkling water? I do Orezza. not. Uh, o R E Z Z A. I discovered that in Corsica. It's the cor it's bottled in Corsica, and I don't normally drink bottled water, fizzy water. Yeah. But for some reason, I uh, got hooked on Oretza. <laughs> and the other thing is the other part of the Corsican. Cuisine is the fish. I ate lots and lots and lots of fish. Right. Uh, the dorade and lou. Fish that you frequently will find in Marseille, for example, or probably Toulouse. Right. Another specialty is the omar uh, and the langouste, langoustine. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, uh, also, I saw quite often the sesh. Ah, yes. S-E-I-C-H-E. -E. Yes. And your listeners may want to look that up. I think it's in the octopus. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a yeah. type of octopus. It's a small one, usually. Yes. Yeah, I find it a little more tender than, uh, than yeah. typical octopus. But I found that often in a salad or with, uh, with pasta. Hmm. Very good. Yeah. You, you make it sound very appealing. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. well, one of my favorite uh, dishes, uh, since we're talking about food, is to get a, a poisson, uh, a poisson du jour au four. Mm. And it would be a, a poisson entier uh, du jour au four. It would be the entire fish of the day that would be baked, I guess, and. Mm -hmm. I went to a restaurant in, in uh, Santuri where they would bring the fish out and show it to you and then take it away to the kitchen, bring it back out, cooked <laughs> uh, for your approval. They'll yeah. show it to you. They'll put it on the plate 
and then fillet it for you and then and serve you the, the vegetables. Yeah. And I, I love that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we'll uh, walk into a restaurant and you will see the fish in a, in a basket or a box right by the door next to a scales. And they will uh, you will pick out your fish and they will weigh it for you. And usually the price was eight euros for 100 grams. Mm. And so one fish uh, for one person is about uh, was 400 grams, so that's 30 euros. It's uh, yeah, it's, uh, pricey, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's a little pricey for a French for a French uh, meal. But hey, it sounds really fresh I'm and on, delicious. Yes, and I'm on vacation, so. <laughs> <laughs> So, so would you recommend that people who want to go? Do, did you did it feel to you more like a romantic type of place, or more a family type of place, or explorer kind of hiker kind kind of place? Oh, I would I would say all of those. Mm. Uh, you can spend uh, uh, a, a lot of money on hotel rooms with fabulous views. You can spend four hundred and five hundred euros a night. Mm. and uh, have a, a fabulous romantic uh, yeah. getaway. And there are, uh, I, I, would, I would wonder about families with, uh, with young kids in the far north. I'm not sure what kind of activities that they would participate mm -hmm. in, possibly going on, um, going on the beaches yeah. and taking some hikes would right. be the... the the best things, mm -hmm. but I, I, there are, I think it's uh, appropriate for for everybody. Uh, very good, very good. Okay, well, we need to wrap it up because we've been talking for forty minutes already. Ah, <laughs> is Stop there any? Very quickly. Yeah, is is there anything else that we missed? No, not that I can think of right offhand. We talked about a lot of stuff that uh, yeah. I wanted to, yeah. to mention. So thank you. So oh, thank you very much. It's been lovely talking to you. How how would you say, since you spend a lot of time in France as well, how would you say Corsica is different from the rest of France? Uh, Corsica is a wild, uh, at least the upper Corsica, is the wild part of France, if you will, because uh, it's uh, uh, when you look inland, when I went through the, the center of Corsica, um, it was undeveloped. The roads were really, really narrow. Mm. Uh, some of the small villages where there uh, looks like there were rural communities, they were not set up with, um, with, uh, with, for tourists. And it just seems like it's an, uh, another time period. Mm. But when you go to the coast, it's, uh, it's pretty much like what I've experienced on the Côte d'Azur, except, for example, when I was driving from Bastia to Massianaggio, I kept thinking, this is probably what the Côte d'Azur looked like a few decades ago. Mm. Uh, it's that kind of still rough around the edges places that, uh, that money hasn't moved in yet. So. <laughs> yeah, it'll happen. It'll happen. Although, yeah. it, it, they, they, you know, because of the strong cultural identity, I don't know that it can really... Um, I mean, Provence welcomed, you know, all of this attention and uh, new people coming in and uh, English-speaking millionaires <laughs> buying all these places. A and I'm not sure that Corsica is quite ready for that. Yeah, possibly. I did notice in saint Florent and Ile Rousse and Calvi that there are very large apartment buildings and they're called residence and they are used to rent out apartments mm. so they're thinking about the influx of tourists and the distances are uh, you know really quite short yeah and so a number of uh, corsicans from the south are going up to that area for vacations and certainly Crossing that uh, pass from Bastia over to Saint Florent, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Corsicans take that trip mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, Corsica does. I, as far as I know, there is no major industry in Corsica. I mean, the industry is tourism. Yes, I mean, and wine and right. uh, and food and, and food produce. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. There's no. a lot of that. 
it's that sort of industry. All right, thank you so much, Michael. You've been super oh, helpful, welcome. and oh, uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your of your time in France. <laughs> I mean, you. Thank you. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> yes, I am. It's a good life. <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you, Madeleine Santiago. Liz and Janella Williamson for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. Patrons enjoy several rewards that you'll find listed at patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N forward slash join us, no spaces or dashes. I share exclusive content with my patrons, including help with your French comprehension, stories about France, photos and a membership into a secret Facebook group. And of course, patrons can message me directly through Patreon and these messages always get top priority. So again, visit patreon.com forward slash join us to see the different reward tiers. And thank you so much for giving back. My thanks also to Lachlan Cook and Elaine Black for sending in generous one-time donations using the green button on any page on joinusinfrance.com that says tip your guide. And if, uh, and if you're not sure your itinerary for France is as good as it needs to be, let me review it for you. It'll cost you 50 bucks, but I will go through your whole itinerary, talk to you on the phone about it, send you recommendations via email. And if you'd like to set that up, email Annie at joinusinfrance.com and make sure to write itinerary review in the subject line. And you can also support the show without spending a penny you wouldn't have otherwise. Before you go shopping on Amazon, go to the bottom of any page on joinusinfrance.com and click on the Amazon ad. And this is true also of the booking.com ad if you're booking hotel rooms, which I assume you are because you're going to France. Because you came to Amazon through my site, I get a small commission and it doesn't cost you a penny more. Thank you so much. There's a new review of my Ile de la Cité tour that I'd like to share with you. The person says, I've three audio tours with Annie Sargent and OMG, I learned so much and so many hidden gems. Love the way she speaks from her podcast and recommended her audio tours for everyone. Thank you so much for writing that. And uh, I'll just go on to my personal update because that's mostly what I've been doing this week is writing the new uh, Saint-Germain-des-Prés tour. And it's it's so much fun. Today I have been looking into the story of Apollinaire, you know, the poet, the French poet. He had a lot to do with Saint-Germain-des-Prés. And uh, yeah, I, I so, so much interesting stuff to uncover and read about. And uh, I've enjoyed that very, very much. I also had a little bit of a health scare this week. Uh, chest pains, <laughs> no fun. It wasn't a heart attack. But my doctor thought it might be, so she sent me to the hospital to get checked out. And I ended up spending a night in the hospital, a couple full days and a, and a night. And, you know, I can't complain because I'm fine. <laughs> Some of the other people who were there were not near as lucky as I am. So it was, a, it was just a scare. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. And apparently it's kind of common after an infection. You can get these sorts of odd pains. Anyway, who knew? That's what you get for being over 50, I guess. And I'll probably talk about this some more on, uh, on an episode about the French healthcare system because I learned a lot and it's actually done quite well. It's annoying that they do so many tests because since healthcare in France is so inexpensive, uh, doctors have no hesitation to order more and more tests. Um, but in a way, they, you know, they cross all the dot no how do you say that they dot all the i's and cross all the t's i think that's how you say it anyway um more on that at uh, at some point i'm sure and i'm still getting ready to go back to paris uh my friend patricia in paris was very very kind and is loaning me her apartment again and so i'll spend a couple of weeks and uh, thank you patricia hello patricia <laughs> and uh, i'll spend a couple of weeks walking this tour uh filling in you know when i do the research from my whole 
home in Toulouse, um, I write down all the things I know I want to tell you about for sure on that route. But then when I'm walking it, I notice other things that are maybe smaller that I hadn't thought of. And so I add them. So it takes me a couple of weeks to get it all tied up and... Uh, tested and recorded and tested again. And uh, <laughs> sometimes I have to re-record things. Although this time I'm hoping to use the World Radio Paris recording studio. So hopefully the sound quality will not be a problem at all. Anyway, all of this going on in my life. Uh, the weather has been amazing in France uh, this month of January. It's not been wet at all which is kind of strange. The fall was wet, but uh, the beginning of this winter has not been. So I'm hoping that it's going to keep going because if it rains every day while I'm in Paris, I will not be happy about that. <laughs> but it's winter. What are you going to do? Also, a quick, quick update uh, about the um, about the the strikes in Paris. Uh, things are calming down. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not going to start up again obviously. But for now, for the people going soon, it should be fairly easy to navigate overall. Oh, and I, I talked about my uh, my tour, my audio tours, but I didn't mention how you can find them. <laughs> See, I'm just a marketing genius. Uh, <laughs> so what you do is you go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash audio tours, and it explains what's available and how they work. Or you can just download the free voice map app on your iPhone or Android, and then you look for tours in Paris by Annie Sargent, and you just purchase that, and there you go. But if you buy it from my website, you get a little bit of a discount. So yeah, that's, you know, it's always good. All right. So let me just remind you that lots of people don't think to look for a podcast to help them plan a trip to France. Please let them know that this is a good way to plan their trip. It's Amazing for inspiration, especially. And of course, if they take good notes, it'll help them do the whole thing. But uh, it will inspire. You know, people always post stuff on the Facebook group like, I'm going to Paris. What's the best? Mm. <laughs> That's a big question. And if you listen to the podcast, you will hear lots of people explain what's the best in their opinion. And that's really a very, very good way to go. Anyway, if you know somebody who's coming to visit France, tell them about the Join Us in France travel podcast. They will find us anywhere they find their podcasts. Also Spotify, Pandora, of course, Apple Podcasts and more. And you can also send them to joinusinfrance.com where they can listen directly from the website. Thank you so much for listening, and, uh, well, I'll talk to you next week. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2019 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>